Of course, you're the first one here, Ali. <laughs> Okay, so salam alaikum and hello everybody. Uh, my name is Omar. I'm one of the uh, core team members for Sacred Footsteps. Sacred, Sacred Footsteps is an uh, online travel publication and it's dedicated to presenting spiritual and alternative travel from a Muslim perspective. We also focus on aspects of history, culture, and um, uh, history and culture which are often overlooked. Uh, you can visit our website on uh, www.sacredfitsteps.org. And um, along with travel articles um, and travel content, we also have um, uh, our Instagram account, which is presenting a lot of stories from different parts of the world. Uh, and it's a curated, uh, it's a publicly curated content. So uh, we encourage anybody who is traveling or has travel content uh, aligning with the uh, values of Sacred Footsteps uh, to get in touch with us on Instagram to see how they can um, be part of uh, be part of that. Uh, you can also find us everywhere on social social media as Sacred Footsteps and on Twitter as S Footsteps. Uh, we also have a podcast on um, Apple, iTunes, SoundCloud, and Spotify. Um, so this, this live is uh, the first time we're doing a Zoom version of this. We've been doing um, an Instagram live version of this for the last, uh, pretty much since uh, the lockdown measures went into effect. Uh, so the purpose behind this was to kind of present more interactive and engaging content, um, you know, on different parts of uh, history and culture, also spirituality. So. Uh, Haroon has agreed very generously to be the guinea pig for the Zoom version of this. So thank you so much, Haroon. I know you're joining from uh, Lahore. So it's like late for you, or it's evening for you. Um, so thanks a lot for that. But I'm just going to do a quick inter introduction of Haroon. So Haroon Khalid is a travel writer and a freelance journalist since 2008. Uh, who has traveled extensively around Pakistan, documenting historical and cultural heritage. Uh, he has written one, two, three, four books now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so his first book was A White Trail, which was uh, about religious minorities in Pakistan. Um, and then he also wrote a book called Walking with Nanak, which I still have not gotten my hands on because delivery times are absurdly delayed <laughs> um, and uh, in search of Shiva which was about um, uh, Hindu heritage in uh, mainland Pakistan and my my personal favorite is Imagining Lahore which is a travelogue about the city of Lahore um, so just to get started Harun can you tell us a bit more about yourself maybe uh, just beyond the introduction that I haphazardly just gave you <laughs> Uh, well, thank you, Umar, for, for having oh. me and, and for this wonderful. I've already told you personally, I'm, I'm a big fan. Of okay. Yeah, it's just cutting off a little. Okay. All right. So I just hope it's something. I'm just, I'm just thanking, uh, thanking you for, for having me. And I've told you personally, I'm a big fan of Sacred Footsteps, a um, great page, great initiative, and something that is much needed. Um, yeah, so I, mean, I think so. I mean, as, as you mentioned in the introduction, I'm, I'm an anthropologist by training, um, as well as a kind of you know, historian, like an amateur historian. So I, I read stuff on my own. I also kind of I'm not a proper academic anthropologist in that sense. So what I, what I usually engage in is, is, is popular anthropology, popular history, uh, because I believe that this, the academic world essentially ends up being very isolated. And the kind of conversations that happen are become very uh, you know, isolated. So, 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 so there's a given need to talk about culture and anthropology and history in, in, in the popular media. That's kind of what I've been doing. I've been writing about um, what I see as, you know, different aspects and anthropological and historical aspects uh, of Pakistan. Um, yeah, and, 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 um, and my, my journey has been essentially all, primarily has all been self-funded. I just love, so I've loved traveling Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've done that essentially around with a full-time job on mm -hmm. weekends, writing, and then and the, the things that I was seeing, the stories that I was hearing, 
uh, were just so incredible in, in, in many ways and stories that you hardly ever get to hear or read about in the context of Pakistan. Uh, you also have to keep in mind that when I'm doing this work, it was around, I mean, I began around 2008 and 9 and 10, and that's essentially when you have a lot of kind of terrorist attacks happening all over the country. So you have, those, you have, you have these conversations about what is, what is true Islam, what is true yeah. religion, uh, and there is this kind of, you can, you can, you, you, you can talk about the Palestinization of others, what is, what is happening. So, so in, in the context of that, I'm discovering these amazing stories, absolutely different alternative ways of looking at religion, of looking at culture, mm -hmm. things that I had completely not been exposed to, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, you know, despite being part of the formal education system for such a long time. So the idea was that, I mean, I was, I was definitely, I, I was deeply moved by those stories and I, and I felt like there was a greater need to talk about those stories in the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, I mean, and even, even with my work on minorities, for example, mm -hmm. um, the idea was, to once again move away from the stereotypical. So when you talk about minorities in Pakistan, mm -hmm. essentially you only talk about them when, when there is some sort of act of mob violence. Uh, right. But what I was doing was I, I was looking at their festivals. I was, I was doing other oral history interviews. And they were and between these events, violent events, which are of course part of their reality, there were also these incredible stories of syncretism, of survival, of mm -hmm. appropriation, and I felt like there's a greater need to talk about the stories and hence kind of started the journey. So that's a good segue into one of my first questions, which is what, in your opinion, what is religious syncretism in, in Pakistan? What does that resemble? Yeah, I mean, so it's, 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 it's pretty interesting to, to talk about religious syncretism in the context of Pakistan. Um, and it and, and, and almost becomes politically very difficult to also talk about religious syncretism in Pakistan, because given our history, given our understanding of what nationalism is, what, what Pakistan is. Mm -hmm. uh, but essentially, I mean, if, 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 if you, so my, my whole thesis is that uh, before the British, before the colonial state, um, there was these very kind of uh, fluid religious identities, fluid cultural identities that survived between multiple religious communities, right? So you had, uh, you had a lot of Muslims, for example, that used to go to Hindu temples. Uh, when we were talking about Lahore, so, the, so the, there were a couple of very popular temples in Lahore where Muslims used to go. Mm -hmm. I interviewed this Hindu uh, pundit from Lahore who, who used to go to the Prophet Darbar pretty wow. regularly. And you, have, and you had these kind of stories from all over Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, and of course, with the, with, with, the, with, the, with the arrival of the colonial state, mm -hmm. what happens is that you have this uh, understanding of, a new understanding of what religion is, a new understanding of what identity is. The census play a very important role in that. You have this kind of more exclusive religious identities that start to spring up in multiple religious communities across so, so Hindu, Sikhs, uh, Christians, and Muslims all kind of start to, to guard their borders much more than, yeah. than the case was earlier. Uh, but so, but so, 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 so of course, so, so, and, and that's the world that we understand today in Pakistan. There's very strict boundaries between religions. This is my this is my religion. This is your religion. This is my space. This is your space. So we kind of are very familiar with that. But yeah. what is happening is that the colonial state or any state for that matter mm -hmm. doesn't really have complete penetration of a society. So you have these multiple spaces, multiple places where some sort of fragment of that pre-colonial culture survives. Now, of mm -hmm. course, I, I'm I'm going to use that word very cautiously, mm -hmm. pre-colonial, pre because I mean, things don't really remain as isolated as as I'm trying to project here. For sure. But just to kind of simplify, just, just to kind of simplify things. I mean, so you you see like things that are uh, communities that are not as really as developed, communities that did not really see the sort of education that came with the colonial state, that mm -hmm. did not really see the same sort of bureaucratic in, uh, infiltration of the colonial state. You still had these shrines in faraway villages, for example, where people were not really as part of the economy or the part or the political system of the colonial state. Many of these shrines still continued. Right, so, so I mean, so you had these shrines where Hindu, Sikhs, Muslims were still going and still, you know, mm -hmm. um, kind of this religious syncretism in that sense mm -hmm. uh, survived. So just, I mean, just to kind of summarize and define what religious syncretism is, it's essentially in a South Asian context, it means that your religious boundaries are, are more fluid and essentially uh, your, your, your devotion towards a particular shrine or, or a particular, uh, or particular deity or a saint um, and hence, 
and, and, and the strict boundaries of religion don't really apply in that sense. Okay, so I'm getting the sense like, you know, I want to get on the word uh, fluid a little bit more. So geographically, when you're talking about religious syncretism in South Asia, uh, is your personal, uh, your personal writing and journeys, uh, like in the context of Pakistan, have they been geographically restricted to, you know, let's say Punjab, or have you had the chance to uh, witness some, witness religious syncretism in multiple different parts of South Asia? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, I, I've mostly worked in Punjab, uh, and that's okay. also because all my projects were self-funded. Uh, hmm. Besides the few years that I've worked with Swiss Prison Archive, uh, but besides that, I mean, all my work has been self-funded. I'm based in Lahore. I was based hmm. in Lahore at that point, hmm. um, and I was traveling over the weekend, so hence it just became easier for me to travel. But I also think Punjab is a, is a very interesting case study because uh, uh, there are multiple sins uh, having that religious syncretism. Uh, and, 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 and that religious syncretism, in some extent, uh, is in the national identity today. For uh, sure. So, it's in these, for example, we'll talk very proudly, we'll talk about very uh, talk about Derulal or Seven Sharif, mm -hmm. uh, all these multiple such as Sarmas, who mm -hmm. kind of in many ways represent that syncretism. But Punjab, because it is so central to mm -hmm. to the state, it was in the pre in, in, in the in the in the colonial uh, state as well. Mm -hmm. It became the most economically um, developed it became the most it had the great educational in that sense so it was very much part of the government state hence these these traditions in punjab i have to keep in mind that punjab saw uh punjab saw the rights of the partition much more than any other province did so, so punjab was impacted by partition much more than any other province for that matter Mm -hmm. So for these traditions to survive in Punjab was for me also quite extraordinary because you all you, you almost expect this to happen in Sindh mm -hmm. and, and other parts of Pakistan, but in Punjab, I think it becomes much more interesting to explore that. Well, even beyond Sindh and Punjab, like when I think about the Buddhist heritage in parts of uh, KP and northern Pakistan, like in I was reading this article uh, about. Uh, Swat Valley and how in Swat Valley there's uh, actually like let me just pull it up because it was really fascinating. Um, it was it's by Rafiullah Khan. It's called um, Socio-Religious Syncretism in Swat and it was talking about um, the Tirtaza Tur Baba Dam. It's, I don't mm -hmm. know if, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, but I guess it's a disputed site um, which which has a lot of Buddhist and Hindu heritage. Uh, which is mm. now part of the mainstream practice of of Islam in the valley, in the Swat Valley. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. I guess like one of the questions that I have then is that um, in Punjab and specifically in Lahore, because I guess that's, um, you know, that's something that you can speak most authoritatively on. How is the shrine culture, like what, what does shrine culture look like? Like what are the uh, significant sites of worship? Uh, what are some practices of devotees? Yeah. Um, see, but what, what has also happened is that uh, because of this rise of this kind of Palavanization and this, and this Palavanized understanding of what Islam is, there, there, there has been a kind of romanticization of the, of the shrine culture as well, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm also I mean, quite skeptical of because mm -hmm. shrines in that sense also can be very, very exploitative and you almost see that practice in many ways when you go there um, and of course can, can you specify ideas that we talk about um i mean I, okay let me, let me just get get to that in, in, sure. in, in, in a second but i i wanted to, wanted to make a point essentially the idea that also when we talk about shrines uh, as being opposite to this kind of puritanical islam that we define in a particular way uh, there's also not one kind of shrine i mean the shrines are multiple traditions right so for example mm -hmm. If you go to Data Darbar, for example, which is a very, very different kind of shrine compared to, let's say, if you go to Shah Hussain's shrine, which is also mm. in Lahore. If you go to Miami's shrine, it's also very different from, let's say, Bulla Shah's shrine. So it, it really depends on what kind of religious tradition that they're following. So, for example, some shrines, like Data Darbar, for example, is very mainstream, mm -hmm. it's as mainstream as a shrine can be. And of course, the Pakistani state also has, has, has to play a very, has to play a very important role in that. It's also the oldest shrine in Lahore, right? It it it, it 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 is the oldest, mm -hmm. and it is of course. So the so, so the Pakistani state also has kind of in all different different politicians kind of owned up that that shrine. It's become the symbol of Lahore. It's become a symbol of you know the shrine culture in many ways. 
Uh, so mm-hmm. the government is very heavily involved in, in monitoring what kind of Islam to follow. But you go to Shah Hussain Shrine, for example, which lies on the outskirts of, not ge- geographically, but metaphorically, it, it lies on the outskirts of, let's say, this understanding of, you know, Islamic mm-hmm. shrines. It's very different traditions. The, the mela there is, is absolutely beautiful mm-hmm. in terms of light, culture. I mean, the fire becomes a very central figure in that, uh, in that, at that shrine. I believe it was part of his stories, if I'm not mistaken. I think Shah Rose perhaps. perhaps yeah, he did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 the, so the fire plays a very central role. And of course, fire itself then has this long tradition of being prominent in uh, Buddhist asceticism and Hindu mm-hmm. asceticism and uh, Christian asceticism. So, I mean, you can almost see that syncretism really live through that fire. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, the Mahal plays a very important role. I was just going to say that the mall is like the yeah, central. And, yeah. yeah, of course. And then, and you won't see the mall in that sense at the mm-hmm. so You will probably see Kavali, but the mall is going to look down upon mm-hmm. and state officials will come, come to you and tell you that's not really a true form of Islam. Uh, so the idea is that, that the more mainstream a shrine gets, and by mainstream, I, I, my argument is that the more the Pakistan state gets involved in the everyday running of a shrine, the more mainstream it, it gets, and it mm-hmm. and kind of ends up losing a lot of these idiosyncratic traditions that it has. So historically, what has also happened is that shrines, each shrine had this had its own peculiarity, right? Yeah. So every saint, every, every deity, for example, had its own function. So let's say if you had measles, you would go to a particular shrine. If you wanted babies, you would go to a different shrine. Yeah. If you wanted to get married, you would go to a different shrine. And and they will all had these different religious traditions. And you mm-hmm. find that some of these traditions still alive, are still kind of very much part of that shrine culture. But mm-hmm. as the Pakaf department, as the, as the Pakistani state gets more involved, mm-hmm. uh, it ends up defining what true Islam is. Mm-hmm. It ends up defining what true traditions are. So a lot of the shrines kind of end up losing their idiosyncratic traditions. Right. Um, and that's the unfortunate thing. By exploitative, I mean, so something I, I, wrote, I wrote in, in Walking with Manak, uh, it was my experience at Uchri. Mm-hmm. It's again a, sh- a, a very much shrine town in that sense, a town that is developed around a shrine. Mm-hmm. And it's a beautiful old historical place. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, I mean, you, you, you go in there and essentially the idea is that if, if you buy this chadar, you'll mm-hmm. be blessed. And then you have to go and then you've, you've seen the grave now and right. you have to give some money. Mm-hmm. Essentially the whole, the, whole, the whole economy of the shrine. It's uh, quite extractive. Yeah. It's, it's quite, I mean, and, and, yeah, but for me, it was, it was very repulsive because you also mm-hmm. go there with this romanticized understanding of shrine. I mean, if you have to also have to keep in mind that mm-hmm. a lot of these shrines are feudal institutions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, so, so you have, you know, very powerful feudals who are head of those shrine shrines, and and they benefit economically, they benefit politically from the shrines, and they have a very powerful position. Mm-hmm. So, so I mean, they are exploitative, exploitative in that sense as well. Mm-hmm. So. Uh... I just want to take a quick pause here and just uh, welcome everybody who has also uh, joined. So um, I'm going to unmute so that people can raise questions. Um, And we'll try to keep this as interactive as possible. I was just uh, telling Harman before that, you know, this is is the first time that we're doing a Zoom version of this. So I'm much more used to the live version where, you know, people are just constantly sending in their uh, typed up questions. Uh, which they're welcome to do here as well through the chat feature, but I'll unmute everybody. So if anybody has a question, they can feel free to raise at this point. Okay, does anybody have any other, any questions? Okay, so it looks like, okay, so we'll keep continuing. And then if anybody has uh, questions, they can feel free to raise them. Um, So one of the things that I, that you touched on is really interesting to me is that, you know, what you talked about the different aspects of, uh, like, each shrine is different in its own respect. My friend is leading a podcast. Oh. (laughs) Your friend would like you to mute your microphone, Rahil Tanoli. (laughs) I apologize. (laughs) Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, I was going to say that, you know, this, this idea of, um, the, the, diff- the different cultures of, uh, all these different shrines, that's something that I noticed in India and uh, Bangladesh as well. Like, you know, the Nizam al uh, shrine in Delhi, for example, is such a central part of, uh, the fabric of the Muslim community in Delhi, yeah. you know, like the Langar on Thursday, 
is like iconic, you know, like there are lines down the neighborhood to just to get in and to like listen to the Kawali and eat. So in some ways, a lot of these, uh, it's, it's evident whether it's mainstream or part of the, uh, part of like the, like the, under the wraps of the city, whatever the cultural, whatever the political significance of the shrine is, it's clear that it's a big part of the community and like the function uh, and the roles that it serves the community. So can you talk about that in Pakistan as well? Like these, like the, the four burjas, for example, is it four or? I mean, I four, I guess, yeah. Yeah, so like the, the four major shrines in Lahore, what are this, what are some of the uh, community services that they offer um so i mean i'm thinking so so, so, I mean, so sometimes i mean what you see is that entire cities end up developing around shrines some shrines are so central to those areas i mean you have for example park Patan, mm -hmm. uh, which the city itself developed around the shrine of Baba Farid. similarly the shrine uh, of uh Bulisha in kasum and kasum is, a, is an older city but the city itself kind of developed around in many ways, and the newer city developed around the shrine of Bulisha. So I mean, that, that almost gives you a sense of how important that shrine is to the identity of, of, of a city. Um, in, in, in terms of community, for example, I mean, this is it's part of everyday life. Okay. Uh, sorry, it's, it's part of everyday life of people. So for example, I, I was talking about the pundits that I interviewed. Um, he, he told me how, for example, when, when he was born, uh, so, and then the first time his he he cut his hair as a child. His mom cut his hair, shaped his hair. Mm -hmm. uh, he was taken to the shrine of Tata Darbar, and that's where they cut off his hair, and, and they kept this little tuft of hair. And the idea was that there was some sort of uh, manat wow. that, that the family asked for. And, and and keep in mind, this is a Hindu family. This is not a Muslim family. Right. Um, I mean, but the, the idea is that I mean, so if if your child is born, you go there, you and you seek the blessing of the of the saint and the shrine and mm -hmm. the deity. Um, if you're getting married, uh, before you're getting married, after you get married, you go to the shrine. Um, mm -hmm. If you were slightly wealthy, you give money for langa. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it, it is very much part of that community. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and understanding that social life revolves around a Sufi shrine. Right. Uh, in a particular, and, and, and you see that much more in smaller towns and smaller cities. I mean, Lahore, of course. And, and the, the more economically developed a place becomes, the more politically developed a place becomes. And I'm not using the word developed in terms of be getting better. Yeah. I mean, in terms of really, you know, conventional understanding that it, it becomes part of the larger global economic structure. Uh, the shrine kind of loses that, that, that community central space. But um, otherwise, in smaller towns, you still see that. I mean, Park Pathan, for example, is, is, is a great example of, of, of an entire city that revolves around the shrine. Mm -hmm. Every shop there is named after Baba Freed or right. Ganj. I mean, it's so central to the town's identity. Yeah. So Baba Freed, I have like a lot of interest in exploring his life <clears throat> because I recently learned that um, his poetry is actually part of uh, the sacred texts in Sikhism. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit more about the exchange between, uh, you know, like Sikhism and Islam? Because even in Walking right. with Nanak, you you talk about, and again, I haven't read the book, so this is just from the reviews that I've read, um, just, but the relationship between Bhai Mardan and uh, Nanak as, as the, like, you know, form of syncretism that uh, a lot of the cultures in Punjab is, uh, are kind of, like, based on and the mythology that follows after in the Kisses. Uh, so can you talk a little bit more about yeah, that? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in order to really understand this, first thing that we have to keep in mind is that when Guru Nanak is alive, and which is around 1400, 1500, mm -hmm. there is no Sikhism. Guru yeah. Nanak is born into, into a Hindu family. The, the Sikh religion develops much later, much after the Guru Nanak's death. That is my central argument. Essentially, the Sikh religion emerged after Guru Gobind Singh, who's the tenth Guru, yeah. as opposed to Nanak, who's the first Guru. Um, so, I mean, and, and the environment that Guru Nanak is is growing up is essentially pre-colonial Punjab, so pre-modern Punjab, traditional town where, once again, you have different religions, mm -hmm. but that does not mean that there is no interaction between them. That that does not mean that the boundaries of religious identities and cultural identities are as rigid as they are today. Right. So, for example, Guru Nanak sees no contradiction in studying Quran. 
uh, and he sees no contradiction in, in also studying, let's say, Bhagavad Gita or, or mm-hmm. Ramayan or other Hindu texts. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so you have this kind of culture of borrowing and sharing. So yeah. in many ways, and in, 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 in my understanding is, Guru Nanak was very much inspired, influenced by Islamic thought. I mean, you have to also understand this is the 1500s, this is 1500s. This is Islam in South Asia is almost at its peak. The yeah. culture is at its peak. The, the intellectual culture is also at its peak. So it's a very different society. Uh, I mean, if you have to be a good scholar, there is no way that you don't engage with Islamic text. Sure. And Guru Nanak, so I mean, so, I mean, because all the text is coming through Islamic all the modern tech. Right, right, it's part of the high culture. Like Islam is part of the high part culture. Of the high culture. The political. Absolutely. Right. So okay. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, Guru Granik himself then engages with Islamic text. And, and, you, all, and, and you see that he, his, there's also a lot of criticism of many Islamic Sufis that he feels are not following true Islam. Right? So in, in many ways, Guru Nanak kind of tells you that, you know what, this is true Islam and many Sufis who are telling you is not what, what true Islam is. Mm-hmm. And this one Sufi saying that he always props up Mm-hmm. As an example of who should who is a good Muslim is Baba Free. Um and, wow. and it feels like Guru Nanak is fascinated by him. Um, mm-hmm. because he just keeps on talking about him over and over again. Uh, he goes to Pak Patan, mm-hmm. he probably engages with engages with his poetry and is he's blown away. And I think it's not just him being a religious scholar, I think because Guru Nanak himself is a poet. Uh, and because we, we think of him as a religious uh, you know figure today, but essentially you have to keep in mind that he is a poet. Mm-hmm. That's what he is. That's what his identity is. And Baba Fareed, along with also being a scholar, is also a poet. And I think that's also where he connects because uh, Baba Fareed is one of those earlier Punjabi poets. And you also see Guru Nanak really taking a lot of symbols and, and metaphors from Fareed's poetry and using that into, into his own poetry. Mm-hmm. So Fareed essentially features into Nanak's philosophy. Mm-hmm. And it's a very direct connection. Um, one of the most remarkable things that I saw when I went to Nankana Sahai for the first time was that mm-hmm. as soon as you enter, I'm not sure if that's the case today, but it was a few years ago. As soon as you enter, the first photo that you see, the first picture of that you see is of Baba Freed. And the second wow. picture that you see is, is Guru Nanak. So Freed is very central mm-hmm. to Sikh uh, kind of philosophy in that sense. Right. And Nankana Sahib is like the birthplace of Nanak. Yeah, that's, that's the birthplace of Guru Nanak. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... Let's talk a little bit more about that, um, you know, that relationship between um, like uh, that, you know, intermingling in Punjab. Like I I remember sitting in lectures on uh, South Asian history and stuff and like overly analyzing the first census because like that was such a watershed moment in uh, colonial history of South Asia that it was the first time that a a colonial administration or any political ruling class was saying okay label yourself and it was a self-labeling in many ways so oftentimes when you look at pre um um like uh, a pre-colonial punjab and the history of punjab there's always like this romanticization of the intermingling and like you know the the more communal nature like the lack of communal violence in punjab um what how do you think the mythological uh, or like the folk tales of Punjab contributed to that kind of uh, co- like, you know, mm-hmm. that community building? Like, mm-hmm. you know, like, like Punjabi can say like he Ranja, yeah. Lela Majnu, yeah. all these, you know. Yeah. Um, see, I mean, yeah. I, 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 in many ways, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, but you also have to keep in mind that, that Punjab, pre colonial Punjab, is also not a static place, right? Yeah. For example, it is, I mean, it has a long history, it goes through different, different time periods. Uh, so, for example, the time that the Guru Nanak is, is writing in and, uh, is much different from the time that Barisha is, is, is or, or Bullisha comes. Right? Right. So, I mean, you, you see Guru Nanak's time is the time when uh, political Islam is kind of, you know, still not as, as, as powerful. I mean, you have the Delhi Sultanate, but you, the Mughal arrival has still not happened. So, so the whole central state has still, still not developed. And, and there seems to be some sort of Muslim-Hindu conflict because uh, Guru Nanak's entire religious movement is, is, is trying to bridge the gap between these two. And so, so why does he feel the need to bridge the gap? There has to be a gap for him to bridge, right? So it's, it's not a very seamless society. Whereas the time that Barisha uh, is, is writing in is a very different time in that sense because mm. it's, the, it's the 1800s, uh, the Mughal Empire is in shambles, mm. uh, Amish Abdali is, is coming in, the Sikh power, is, the political power is, is rising. So his understanding of culture society is very different. Mm. Uh, but of course, the, the colonial state is, of course, a fundamental 
shift that almost becomes this watershed moment, as mm -hmm. you mentioned, the senses mm -hmm. completely changes. But you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm reading Varisha nowadays, and that's oh, wow. of, 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 of a project for him. And it's right. absolutely, I mean, he, Ranja, is absolutely fascin fascinating in that sense that it really gives you a sense of that kind of syncretism of mm -hmm. Punjab that, that I am trying to search for. Mm -hmm. and it's beautiful how uh, on, on one line he would quote Quran, and on the yeah. next line he would quote Ramayan, and on the third line he would he would quote Plato. It's yeah. absolutely incredible the kind of society that, that he was part of. Like he mm -hmm. sees no contradictions in doing that. He, mm -hmm. he talks about the five Sufi Peer praying for Hira Ranja, and at the same time you have this Jogi mm -hmm. uh, who's not a Muslim also praying. So, so mm -hmm. the idea is that the Jogi's prayer is also as powerful as the Peer's prayer. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating in that sense. So one thing I remember, like one of the incidents that stuck in my head uh, was, you know, this idea of like ownership that like nobody owns these, uh, these stories yeah. and these saints. Um, mm. There's like this like communal event, uh, community ownership. Uh, and in one of the episodes that we have coming out soon uh, for the podcast is on Kowali, <laughs> uh, where actually Shahroz uh, and uh, our team member Yasmin also talked about this, that where like uh, these folk tales are so woven to the fabric of this shared history that like every person like by the time Varsha wrote about uh, these are in the 1800s but these stories and traditions had already existed for some like decades right so or centuries I should say um, yeah. so one of the incidents I remember in Delhi was that um, the uh, the Nakshab uh, of the of the yeah. shrine in Nizamuddin, who kind of, you know, uh, for those who are listening who don't know, Sajda Nashin are kind of like the, um, the like they're the maintainers of the shrine. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he was collecting donations um, on the night for Langar and the Sikh man came and he offered his prayers and he like, you know, uh, donated a little bit of money but he was telling uh he was telling the guy that like why are you collecting money right at the right at the doorstep of as soon as you enter uh the tomb of nizamuddin like you shouldn't be here like this is a holy site and i was mm -hmm. like taken aback because i was like oh wow like this is clearly like you know that challenge is not met with hostility it's more like coming from a place of uh, respect and the uh, the desire to maintain the the religious sincerity of the place. Yeah. So, like, in the in terms of the political landscape in Pakistan, uh, you mentioned that a lot of the devotees are other religious minorities in Pakistan. How do you think they are navigating the politicization of these shrines? See, what, what about, I think so my, so my thesis is particularly with the Hindu community that I was working with mm -hmm. in Punjab, was that as it's, it's, it's not just the Muslims who become more uh, aware of their distinct identity. Every community has. Uh, so for example, in Punjab, you had Arya Samaj, you had Hindu Mahasabha, you yeah. the Sikhs, you have Singh Sabha movement. Mm -hmm. So the, every community essentially pre, you know, during the colonial era, earlier colonial era, developed a very distinct identity. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, and, and in, in Punjab, I mean, that's one on, on, on one hand, so you have that. But then, of course, having said that, uh, there are certain communities who kind of, who, who were missed in, in, that, in that colonial frame and who, who are still kind of going to shrines. But, but I think what has also happened is that with the, with the Islamization of the state and, the, and, and social space in Pakistan, particularly after Ziaul Haq, what also happened, have happened was that as a response, you also have a Hinduization and a Christianization of other religious communities as well. So every community in that sense reacts to Islamization in its own particular way, becomes more aware of its own identities. Mm -hmm. uh, and over time, what you also see is that, so for example, once again, the generation that I'm to, I will be talking to would be the older generation who feel it is all right for them mm -hmm. as a Hindu to go to a, a Sufi shrine. But then the younger generation who are, let's say, more uh, politicized in, and who have a better understanding of how Islamization has happened are also more aware of their Hindu identity. And they see their Hindu, Hindu identity as distinct from the Islamic identity. So you, you almost have that generational gap as well. Yeah. So it's not like 
so the, so the idea is that one once one community gets more uh, starts drawing up its borders mm -hmm. of its identity other communities also respond in that way uh, and with islam being the dominant religion the, do the dominant political force mm -hmm. it does dictate what will happen in you know other communities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so that's that's kind of what's happening we like so uh, uh again in some of the research that i was doing uh leading up to this discussion i came across an article on the bb bb park diamond shrine um and we've covered this in our own um like uh, uh instagram stories as well about uh through Sharos, i believe um about how different this shrine is particularly because the uh, majority of the devotees that come are women and men are not allowed if i'm correct men are not allowed uh, in the yeah. okay. um and the the central figures that are buried in the in the shrine are all women there are five women right yeah. Yeah. so um there was there was this talk about like i because we were talking about community history in the article she mentions that um there is no central pirni or like you know like rakhwala like you know the the this, the maintainer of the shrine basically there's no like one central family that uh, that maintains it uh and there's no collective um understanding of what the sh what the significance of the shrine is uh there's disputes over who is actually buried um so can you can you first start off with like my first question is can you tell us a little bit more about bibi park daman like the history of that shrine uh so bibi park daman it's a fascinating shrine. It's in Lahore, um, and, and somebody wrote wrote to me. I don't remember her name, and it was her thesis, which I feel like makes a lot of sense. Is that um, the shrine perhaps developed around a tree? So, so there is a, there is a central tree there, which is which is very old. I believe it is a berry tree, mm -hmm. and berry trees have historically been uh, sacred in the in the South Asian religious tradition. As symbols um, of, as symbols of what? Uh, I mean, I'm not sure. We'll we have to look, look into this, but I mean, there, okay. there is a long tradition of tree worship, right? Okay. So banyan trees are sacred, people trees are sacred, kikar okay. trees are sacred, berry trees are. So these are all like old kind of traditions. So uh, yeah, so so a lot of what also happens is uh, that shrines develop around uh, a tree, and and sometimes uh, it becomes impossible to directly worship a tree, particularly as 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 a Muslim, let's say. Uh, so what happens is sometimes graves kind of erupt. Uh, as a way to justify the worship of that space. Th this is what um, you received from this person. Like this, that was, was this, the this was her. This was her thesis because okay. even if you go to Bab Bibi Park Daman today, and I've been there a couple of times, yeah. the tree plays a very important role in the in the whole ritual. So you go there and you and you eat the leaf of the tree for some ritual, or if you have a have a prayer, you mm -hmm. kind of tie something to the tree. So her thesis was that the tree is very very much part of the mm -hmm. of the worship. And I've seen this at many other Sufi shrines where trees have a very important sacred space. And I've made that argument that it is actually the tree that is being worshipped. And sometimes the grave is used as an excuse to worship the tree because the tree cannot be directly worshipped. But the tree, there's a long tradition of, of tree worship that comes directly from the Indus Valley and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, that's, that, that's one interesting thesis. And I feel like that makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. which explains the origin of Bibi Park Daman in many ways. But what also very fascinating for me is about Bibi Park Daman is, is the Shia Sunni element into it. Uh, so Bibi Park Daman is one of those rare kind of Sufi shrines in Punjab where both Shia and Sunni are very much part of the devotees. Mm -hmm. um, and the identities are kind of, so, 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 there's, so there's a whole history of, I think uh, it has this, this huge kind of uh, commemorating uh, processions there at, on, the, on the time of Karbala and the Sunni community there protects mm -hmm. that, uh, that uh, you know, procession mm -hmm. and that's very rare to find today in in, in the hall because of the political change in political landscape so right. that was also something that was very fascinating for me and that particular shrine okay so i'm just going to take a quick pause here just to remind people that um you can feel free to send in questions through the chat feature but i'm just going to unmute uh so if somebody has questions that they want to raise they're welcome to do so um i feel like there's, there's a couple of questions that yeah there are questions. some questions that have come in so um let's let's take a look at the one by Furkan. Um why do Muslims in South Asia have an affinity towards shrine compared to Muslims in other regions? I feel like we did touch on this a little bit, but I do want to go in a little bit deeper into this about how the uh how Islam as a practice, uh as a religion arrived in um 
uh, in South Asia and the negotiations between the Shishti Nizam from uh, Afghanistan yeah. with the political ruling class. So can you touch uh, a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, I feel like shrines are a part of Islamic culture in many societies. So I don't, I don't think it's just unique to South Asia, um, Iraq, Iran, uh, Afghanistan, Morocco, Turkey. Uh, so you have, and I know, I know even like North Africa. So this, so this shrine culture is, uh, Sufi shrines are very much part of, of uh, Islamic culture throughout the world. Uh, what, what I think the argument that you can make which, and you have a point there, is that there is something unique about shrine culture in South Asia. So every, every geographical region will have a different culture around the shrine. So for example, in Turkey, I was talking to somebody and the idea is that shrine culture there is very mainstream, mm-hmm. very much part of the Islamic religious identity, whereas in South Asia, now they become more marginalized as opposed to you know, a different understanding of Islam. Um, and of course, it, it depends on the historical, political influences, so how Islam came into South Asia. Uh, and, and the kind of religious tradition that survived here. Uh, it, it came through Sufi saints, um, and many communities that converted were Hindu or priests, you know, pre-Islamic. I mean, the term Hindu itself is, is very politicized, it's very communal, yeah. um, and you have to kind of deconstruct the whole term as well. But there were certain religious, re- religious traditions that were simply translated from one community to another. Uh, so the bhajan, for example, you, you can make an argument that the bhajan became Qawwali, uh, there, there, there's a concept of dhamal as well within the Hindu ascetic tradition, and that became dhamal, uh, Hindu dervish, sorry, the Hindu, the Hindu ascetics that link back to Shiva have the entire traditions around asceticism, mm-hmm. around fire, around ash that became part of the dervish Sufi culture. So there's a, there's a lot of culture. So there's a, there's a religious translation, a cultural translation that happened. Uh, so the, I think just to kind of a rephrase your question, perhaps that yeah. you, you you can make an you, you you can make an argument that there's a distinct Sufi shrine culture in South Asia, mm-hmm. uh, which is different from other Sufi shrine cultures. But I feel like Sufi Sufi shrines and shrine culture is part of multiple multiple societies. I would agree. Um, so that we'll take the next question, which is from Zarar. Uh, a question related to Sikhism: Why is it often uh, seen as closer to Hinduism than to Islam? Uh, especially given Baba Farid's influence uh, to Sikhism, which we just talked about. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about Guru Nanak, right? So, I mean, mm-hmm. Guru Nanak, I feel like, is very inspired by Baba Farid. What happened to Sikhism after is that, uh, and, the, and the second guru, there, there's been a lot of literature on this, where the second guru kind of brings in some rituals that he directly borrowed from Hinduism. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, he, he was a devotee of Lakshmi, uh, like the, the goddess. And so, so, there's a lot of rituals that kind of become part of uh, the you know the the Sikhism in that sense. But I feel like there's also you have to see this see this in, in through the prism of politics, right? Because uh, the the latest Sikh gurus were directly in conflict with Mughal Mughal rulers, mm-hmm. um, and so so, so and, and of course there, there's a whole politicization of that where most Mughals are seen as Muslims. So there's a, so there's, a, there's an entire history or understanding of history where. There is an idea, there is a sense of Hindu, Muslim, and Sikh conflict. But I feel like, I mean, of course, it wasn't really a Muslim Sikh conflict, but it becomes a Muslim Sikh conflict more so after the colonial state. Yeah. And I feel like this is, this is something the colonial state also really, the British really exploited. Mm. Uh, so, whereas on, on, on one hand, senses, as you mentioned, is very much part of how these identities are maintained, yeah. history also becomes a political tool at the hands of the British and how they taught history and how history is imagined. It's very, very important there. So essentially, yeah. to, to put it very simply, the British colonial idea was, which is very much part of the Indian Hindu narrative, sorry, the Hindu nationalist narrative, mm-hmm. but also very much part of our narrative is that, except Islam and Christianity, every other religion in, in South Asia is indigenous. Mm-hmm. So Sikhism became an indigenous religion, and you know, Buddhism became an indigenous religion, Hinduism became an indigenous religion. Yeah. And the idea so is that the, if you're the indigenous, you are closer to yeah. The reason I asked the question was, if you look at the, so I agree with you, I think the, has, the politics have really played a part into this. From a purely theological perspective, if you're reading the Guru Granth Sahib today, you can't deny reading Baba Frey's poetry in his work, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. to, a, to, a, to, a, to a Muslim, if we read the, the Glorious Quran or read the Testament or whatever, if you come across a Muslim saint like Baba Freed, you know, from your experience or understanding, does it raise, does it raise questions? I have friends who are Sikhs. And they've never realized Baba Freed is even Muslim. They assume he's a Sikh. So from a mm-hmm. theological perspective, you know, aside from politics, I find it interesting that 
Sikhs, even the last 50 years, even, even contemporary Sikhs, don't turn to Muslims on a theological level. We do have a brotherhood, mm, yeah. you know, obviously. There's a struggle yeah, yeah. In, in, in terms of land and in Pakistan, whatever. But I was, I'm always wor- curious why we don't have that bond theologically. It makes so much natural sense, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think you've, you've already kind of answered the question yourself. The idea that it's, be, it's become politicized. It's, it's partition played a huge role. Uh, the right, violence yeah. of partition played, played a huge role. Uh, understanding of history plays a huge role. Uh, I mean, Guru, you read Guru Granth Sahib, it's monotheism is such a central feature of Sikhism. I mean, Guru Nanak's central message is monotheism, which directly comes from Islam in that sense. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so, I mean, so there is a lot of borrowing and sharing and it's a huge theological influence, I would argue, uh, which so, comes from Islam, intellectual. But yeah, I mean, you're right, absolutely. It's, it's kind of not really, because of how history has unfolded in the past 100 years, Mm-hmm. Uh, it is something which is not really talked about. Mm-hmm. But you have, I mean, if, if you talk to some Sikh scholar, for example, when I was, in fact, at this um, at this uh, conference, and this is an academic conference in, in California, you have these Sikh scholars, and they're talking about, uh, you know, uh, Kirtan, which is, which is part of Sikh traditional music, and, they, and they're talking about Langar. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, 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 and the whole idea was that how Langar is something which is unique to Sikhism. And we had a huge argument there. Uh, I mean, and I'm, 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 I'm not a chauvinist nationalist in that sense, but I'm like, you know, I mean, be at least, at least be intellectually honest. You mm-hmm. can't make an argument that Langar is not coming from the Tishti Sufi Silsila. Uh, right. And, and or, or, or Kavali had an influence on, on Kizan for that matter. So yeah. you're absolutely right. There are these huge influences which today are not, not talked about mm-hmm. because of multiple political, how history has unfolded. Before, before I take Adil's question uh, or his uh, layered question. I just want to uh, quickly um, share an anecdote. When I was in India, I went to, I was very fortunate. I visited to uh, Banaras and in uh, Banaras University, the main campus is uh, around the Hanuman Mandir. Um, And in that temple, actually around the walls, there are English translations of uh, the Vedas and the Bhagavad Gita. And I remember, I still have these pictures, uh, which like reading them, if it didn't say at the bottom what verse or section of the Gita or the Vedas it's referencing, to a lay person, you wouldn't be able to distinguish between the monotheism that's being expressed in those Mm, verses. And I remember bringing that up with the tour guide who was was showing me around. And he was like, well, Firstly, the mandir does receive a lot of, um, uh, like a lot of Muslim devo- uh, Muslim devotees, Sikh devo- devotees. It's the same, the same as the Sufi shrine, um, in terms of like the cultural significance of it. But you know, more more than that, he was saying that a lot of the a lot of the establishment uh, in of the Hanuman mandir in 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 the campus because it's on a student campus. There's a lot of like students that, that are actively preserving the. Um, the communal nature of the religion rather than really focusing on like the saffronization that's taking place in broader India uh, with the Hindu community becoming more um, uh, assertive over uh, Hindu ideology. So that was really an interesting piece where I felt that like, because I had seen some of that in Karachi, for example, um, in uh, Abdullah Shah Ghazi. Um, mm-hmm. but I hadn't seen that in, in India. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, just want to transition. So if, 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 if I could just add to that, I mean, mm-hmm. uh, I think also the, the whole idea is what really is Hinduism. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there, there's a whole kind of literature on how Hinduism as we understand today, and even how it is understood by the Hindus is mm-hmm. a product of the colonial state. Uh, it was never really, it was, it was never really a religion in that sense. It, was, it, it, it just had multiple philosophical movements mm-hmm. that are part of it, right? So yeah. you had, I mean, for example, you have, this, there's also a, st- a very strong strand of monotheism mm-hmm. and monoism within Hinduism. Uh, mm-hmm. And you have somebody like Al-Biruni, for example, who is this geographer and who's mm-hmm. this anthropologist, sociologist, from one, an Arab anthropologist, I mean, I mean not an anthropologist in that sense, but somebody who did anthropology, very real anthropology, mm-hmm. 1,000 years ago in South Asia, mm-hmm. who makes that claim in his book, that Hinduism at its core is a monoistic religion, is a monoistic wow. religion. 
so you, and then you, of course you have even Arya Samaj movement, for example. I was just going to say the I yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So yeah. So, so I mean, so, so so within Hinduism itself, there were these multiple traditions: the Bhakti tradition, mm -hmm. uh, the 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 Jogi tradition is very much part of. Is is essentially today you you can label that as Hindu, but it's very much inspired by Sufi Dervish, and, and then Bhakti also influ influenced Sufi Dervish. Uh, mm -hmm. So these are these, these huge bodies and sharings that are happening between all communities. It's just, it became more politicized mm -hmm. in the past 100, 150 years. Right. Uh, so I just wanted to transition to Adil's question. Uh, and just before I read that, you guys, the mic your microphones are unmuted from my side. So anytime you feel the need to re raise a question, you can just unmute yourself and um, feel free to interrupt the conversation. Um, so, okay, how can we make Sufi shrines more popular amongst the more Islamized, Islamized, Islamicized um, middle class of South Asia who may see them as backwards and not aligned with Orthodox Islam? Yeah. Um, I mean, so as, as I mentioned, Adil, it's a great question. Uh, that, that in many ways, so as long as the, the, the exploitative nature of Sufi shrines survive, uh, they will be very repulsive to a lot of people. Uh, the, the feudal element to it, the, the constant extraction of money, like there's a whole, there's a huge commercialization of Sufi shrines in that sense, which is very, very problematic. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, I've, I'm somebody who, who loves the idea of Sufi shrines, who goes there and researches, and I find that very repulsive. Um, so, so, so the idea that, I mean, that exploitative element of Sufi shrines need to be addressed mm -hmm. if you are to use, if, if you are to use this as a, as a, as a movement, which is more mainstream. Um, I feel like also, I, I feel like in many ways, and this might be a very unpopular argument, but I feel like uh, there is this, this revival of, of interest in Sufism within the educated middle class in many ways. And I feel like that's, 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 that's kind of a reaction. The, the whole idea of soft Islam, mm -hmm. Coke Studio, for example, Janoon, Atif, yep. everybody's singing Sufi. Yep. And, and I feel like at, at some level it's been overdone now yeah. uh, in, in many ways. Um, and there's a huge commercialization are, taking place of Sufism, there is, there is, like there the is, fact yeah. that Coca-Cola owns like the sound of the nation, like that's how Coke Studios yeah, branded yeah, the tagline. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, but but have, having said that, I mean, I for example, the first time I heard of Bullish Shah was through Janoon, which is which is for me also very interesting, um, and I'm and I'm glad they they sang Janoon, uh, mm -hmm. they they, they sang Bullish Shah and helped me discover him. Mm -hmm. uh, so I feel like it is happening to some extent, but uh, you also have to understand that also there, there is sometimes a gulf between the saint himself and the shrine. The shrine becomes exploitative, shrine becomes bureaucratic, shrine mm -hmm. incorporates these rituals um, and becomes more commercialized, whereas a saint, for example, is somebody very different. So Bullisha, for example, if he comes to his shrine today, would have a lot of issues with what has happened to his shrine. Mm -hmm. I feel like Baba Farid, if he comes to his shrine, Today will be also very upset with what is happening at his shrine today in the name of, in, in, in his name essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, so so there, there's perhaps uh, what do we mean by shrines? What do we mean by Sufi saints? I feel like there's perhaps a greater need to go back to the message of the Sufis uh, and read them in their own poetry, read Sufi's poetry, read Bulisha's poetry, mm -hmm. uh, and you almost in in many ways you almost transcend these these shrines and the bureaucracy and the ritualization around it. Yeah. Which perhaps in many ways was their message. Mm -hmm. Actually, that really made me, and i sorry, Zarar, for putting you on the spot like this, but what you just said reminded me of an article that um, Zarar wrote on visiting uh, Imam Ghazali's tomb, where he, um, I don't want to put words in his mouth because he's, he is right here, but um, where he talked about like just the idea of having a tomb dedicated to Ghazali would feel so contradictory mm -hmm. to Ghazali's own um, ideology. So do you think that mm -hmm. there is an element of that where like, you know, people are venerating these saints to a degree where, you know, even the, the ideologies of the saints themselves would feel at odds yeah. with? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with Baba Free, for example, the Bhishti Darwaza, which is a very popular Darwaza, the whole, which is, which is only open at his course. The idea is that if you pass through that door, you, mm -hmm. will, you will be uh, assured a place in heaven. I mean, I'm sure if Baba Farid comes back today, he'll just laugh at it. It, it makes, yeah. I mean, you, read, you read his poetry, it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, the whole idea of, I mean, Bullish Shah, for example, was an, was an I, 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 iconoclast. I mean, he, he would disagree with the whole idea of having a shrine. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's somebody who, who doesn't believe in shrines, for that matter. Yeah. Uh, Shah Hussain is somebody who completely challenged gender norms, who 
challenge sexuality and today his shrine doesn't allow women and mm-hmm. Shao Sen would also would, would has mocked the whole idea of being a woman and being a man in his school. Well even even they, Bilisha, they a huge contradiction. Yeah. Even Bilisha, like he like his famous uh, incident of uh, you know uh, appeasing uh, his spiritual mm-hmm. leader by dressing mm-hmm. as a woman and dancing. Yeah. Like and the yeah. fact that Bilisha's shrine doesn't allow uh, women. That's like Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's that's the biggest irony. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, there, there are some questions from uh, Fatma Bibi. Why is there, why is there more emphasis on associating a wish to things like locks, strings in the shrines, uh, in the shrines in South Asia, uh, which is something that you don't see in uh, South Africa, Indonesia, Turkey, and Syria. Mm-hmm. So I guess yeah. that idea of a manat. So can you talk yeah. a little bit more yeah. about that? Yeah, I think I think it clearly comes from the pre-Islamic religious traditions that were part of South Asia. I mean, we can today call them Hinduism. Uh, because that's how we've codified it. But I mean, these are traditions that some archaeologists have argued were also happening at the Indus Valley. So in many ways, you see a continuation of that tradition that were part of this religious community. I feel like, I mean, I haven't done and I haven't read much ethnographic or anthropological work on shrines in Indonesia. Mm-hmm. But, I'm, but I'm pretty sure that if you un, kind of uncover these traditions, you'll find that they will have traditions that come from their religious traditions of that time. Of, of mm-hmm. their of their area, so because the kind because of the nature of religion in South Asia, they became part of. I mean, these, these were practices that were practiced happening at temples, at Hindu temples, or at other other non-Islamic, uh, pre-Islamic shrines, mm-hmm. and they were translated into an Islamic tradition. Essentially, mm-hmm. yeah. Um. So, uh, before I, uh, I'll read the second question as well. Uh, would you know the names of the saints that are buried, uh, in Bibi Pak Daman? So before I let you answer that, I just want to read actually in the article on Bibi Bhagdaman, um, the author uh, pr- like translated the Urdu fa- pamphlet that's distributed on the description of uh, the shrine. Uh, if that's okay with you. <laughs> uh, okay, so it says, when the event of the Karbala was to happen, Imam Hussein selected some of his followers to send to places abroad to spread the news of the atrocities being committed uh, on the Ahl al-Bayt, which is the household of the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, in order that their martyrdom was exposed. It is evident from the history that history books that the Bibi Pak Damana reached Lahore accompanied by 704 helpers. Imam, Imam Hussein himself told them to go to Hindustan and also predicted that from your going there, a time will come that a mighty Muslim empire will be established there. When the Bibiya reached Lahore, the fire in the ashrams of Hindus, uh, in Hindu temples burned out and the idols fell, fell and broke. The king at the time, a Hindu known by the name of uh, Bur- Burmantari Mahabharan, inquired and was told that pious women from Arabia had come to the king's house. The king then sent his son to escort the Bibiya to his court. Upon arrival, before he could could look at the Bibiya, the son of the king fainted, and when he gained consciousness, he accepted Islam. His name was Baba Haki. The king still wanted to meet the Bibiya, so he he sent another envoy. The Bibiya prayed in the court of the uh, Almighty and said, "Uh, we have trialed and tested in the way of your religion in the form uh, of the incident of Karbala, and we do not wish to suffer another horrible incident, so please save our sanctity and hide us behind a veil. Their prayer was uh, answered immediately. The earth parted and the bibia descended into the ground. A part of their clothing, the daman, was left outside. They got the name Pag Daman, uh, and that part of that clothing uh, later also went into hiding. So this is the translation of the Urdu pamphlet that's being distributed outside of the Bibi Pag Daman. And from reading this for me was like really fascinating because it, it's such a, again, like, you know, none of this is grounded in um, confirmed sources of history. It's just, yeah, yeah. my guess is that this was just like the oral tradition that surrounded yeah, yeah. and then it was formalized into text. So yeah, yeah. Um, with that, I just, I'll let you answer as well, like what you think, uh, <clears throat> sorry, what the history of the, the people buried in the shrine are. Yeah, no, I mean, I have the name written somewhere, uh, but I guess, I mean, I, I don't remember them by my memory. So maybe you could, you could tell the names? Or... I do, uh, well, there are some names that are circulated, but again, they're disputed. There's like Shahnaz, um, 
there's um, um, they're like they're all over, you know. Like it's uh, Bibi Gohar, Bibi Shahnaz, Bibi Noor, Bibi Taj, and Bibi Hoor. So mm. th those are the five, and they're meant. They're said to be like the uh, companions of Prophet Akil. So mm. hopefully that answers your question. But again, the central point is that it's the unknown which is which is more fascinating because there's no way of actually confirming. Yeah. 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 And just to kind of talk about, I mean, not particularly about Bibi Bhagdana Shrine, but another really fascinating story, which is very South Asian, is the whole tradition of uh, Brahmin Hindus, mm -hmm. sorry, uh, Brahmin uh, Husseini, Husseini Brahmins. Uh, and and there's, there's a whole kind of, and Sunil Dutt, for example, really famous, Sonja Dutt's father, mm -hmm. comes from that tradition of Husseini Brahmin. Um, and the idea was that they are Brahmins, they're Hindus, but they're also devotees of Imam Hussain. And right. the entire mythology of how they went and they, and they wanted to fight on Imam Hussain's behalf, but before they could reach uh, the Shahada that already happened, so uh, they kind of came back. But there's also, there's also a beautiful story there as well. So, I to point that out. so we have a question from Rida Akhtar, which is talking about recent developments like uh, the Kartarpur Corridor. Um, how do you see Kartarpur Corridor as a collective shrine for people to explore? Yeah, no, it's, it's I absolutely love the initiative. I haven't been there. I've written about it and I really wanted to go there this time, but unfortunately the situation has not. Can you um, give like a brief uh, background on the significance of Kartarpur? So, so Kartarpur is where Guru Nanak is, is buried. Um, and there's also a whole, a whole tradition of where well, he was not buried, but he was rather uh, cremated and, and you know, so, so this, this was, so Gunanak is one of those rare figures in history who has a grave and also has a samad, which is constructed after you are cremated. Um, so you, and, and, and then the whole idea was that he had Hindu and Muslim followers, and the Muslims wanted to bury him and the Hindus wanted to cremate him. So in, so, in many ways, Gunanak is a central figure who has devotees across religious boundaries. Uh, right. Because he's so fascinating. So, so this was his, his shrine, this was his final resting place. Mm -hmm. So after Nankana, you can make an argument that this is the most important Sikh shrine. Uh, and before partition, in fact, uh, I've had a conversation with some with a Sikh scholar who made an argument that Golden Temple was not as prominent as Katarpur mm -hmm. uh, before partition, and Golden Temple only became much more prominent because of partition. Partition. So, so, yeah. so, 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 so Katarpur is actually as actually that important, the most central shrine in the Sikh mm -hmm. tradition. Uh, so recently, it was of course it was renovated, and now it's really on the border. It was in a horrible condition mm -hmm. for a very long period of time. And I think what is also really remarkable about well, not just opening up Katarpur is that it is also open for Pakistani. Uh, and as Muslim, and I know many people have gone there, which is absolutely fascinating. So it has raised entire conversation about who Guru Nanak was. Mm. Uh, for the first time, I feel like you've had multiple articles in the in, in vernacular newspapers about mm. Guru Nanak. Somebody was telling me how there was a Guru Nanak, uh, one of his songs was playing on the uh, radio, uh, which is absolutely remarkable. So what Kazapur has also done is it's initiated this entire conversation. It's initiated this, this, this curiosity about who Guru Nanak was, what Sikhism mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And it also provides a place where for the first time, Indian and Pakistanis can just sit together. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and you, you hear absolutely beautiful stories about people sitting and meeting and, and talking to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so you, you have these wonderful stories. Um, and it's, 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 it's remarkable in that sense. And I'm very excited about it. I hope it lives up to his promise. Um, yeah, that's all I can say. Uh, and from Samina, we have, uh, what do you have to say about these saints being shunned often as non-believers in their lifetime and their resilience in terms of sticking to their beliefs, whether progressive or not? What should that teach us about extremist Islam today? That's yeah, a heavily I mean, loaded question. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, they, they, there is a beautiful uh, line by Bullah Shah, which, and I'm not sure if I can uh, pronounce it, uh, you know, or I, 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 can, I can recall the entire line, but it's something like, the new kafir kafir ahu ahu ak. So the idea is that they might call you kafir, so I mean, essentially let them call you kafir. Like, as long as you know what your truth is and you know what you believe in, uh, it doesn't matter to Bullah Shah what people talk about him, what, mm. what people say about him. Um, yeah, so I mean, and, and I feel like, that essentially is also how we should remember uh, how who Bilisha is. Uh, I'm not sure if, if that answers your question, uh, but 
Is, is that is that the question, or can you just also let me, let me see? Amrit, can you tell me if I'm missing anything? In the... uh, what should that teach us about standing against extremist Islam mindset in our current times? That's the second part of the question. Hmm. I feel um, like, I mean, in my personal opinion, and I'll let you talk as well. But uh, I I feel like, you know, it's like these are the reason why this is such a weighted question is because it's like not grounded in just the religiosity of it, right? Like it's also about the political uh, political struggle and like the, like, like we talked about the Talibanization of Pakistan. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, like you can answer this question without necessarily, uh, without necessarily looking into like the broader geopolitics of the situation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, also, I mean, I think unfortunately what has ha also happened is that post 9-11, mm -hmm. uh, ex extremist Islam has also become a very political term. Like, who really is an extremist Muslim in that sense? Mm -hmm. uh, like, the idea is that somebody who believes in a certain understanding of religion, but is not really harming anybody in that sense. That, and I might disagree with that interpretation of Islam. Does, does, does that make him extremist? Um, so, I mean, I mean, yeah, so this, this question itself can be deconstructed. Been deconstructed in, 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 in many ways. Uh, and I feel like, as, as you as Omar, you mentioned, the whole idea of extremist Islam is such a political question because it because in that sense, it's really a, a, a product of, of politics in, in mm -hmm. multiple ways. But I guess, uh, I mean, Bullishad, so I mean, I, I think how I would kind of rephrase that is essentially, and of course, orthodoxy is also a term that you can't really use in Islam because it has a whole history that it comes from Christianity. But let's say, of course, to keep things simple. Let's say, I mean, Bullah Shah's movement or Shah Hussein's movement for that matter, and even Baba Farid's movement for that matter was a movement against religious orthodoxy. Yeah. Right? The, the, idea, the idea that you as an individual cannot explore your own understanding of truth. You cannot explore your own understanding of religion and that you need some intercession, intercession. You, you need some sort of a mediator who will interpret the true religion for you. And I guess, Wherever that is, I mean, I mean, and, and that's something I was, I was mentioning about Sufi shrines as well. Whereas today we don't associate them as extremist Islam, right? Because of what extremist Islam has come out to be after 9/11. But in many ways, I find that shrine culture very problematic because whatever the Sufi saint says becomes mm -hmm. Islam. Yeah. Um, and if he says that I am Islam, then he is Islam, which is which is a very very problematic concept as well. So Bullish, I would also kind of talk about that. We'll be right against that. So he's not writing against any particular ideological movement rather he's, 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 he's saying that you know what the idea is that if that's your own if that's your ideology then do believe in your own ideology but also be open to other people's ideology let them be yeah it's about it's about pluralism yeah it's about pluralism it's, and it's also about discovering your own truth as opposed to following somebody blindly may it be sufi shrine may it be whatever ideological movement Mm. Discover your own truth. And I feel like every from Nanak to Fari to Bullishar to Shah Hussain, mm. that remains a central aspect. So individuality is something which is very important. So on that positive note of discovering your own truth, I hope that you know this is a good way this is a good uh, place to end the conversation. Um, as as a call to action for a lot of people that are listening, uh, to kind of, you know, like read these texts with um, with that plurality in mind and actually uh, learn about what they have to say because uh, oftentimes it gets translated and these are traditional uh, texts which have constantly evolved over the centuries. So there's, uh, there's such a diversity of interpretations out there on Bulisha, on, on Shah Hussein and like, you know, uh, Baba Fareed. So um, any la as a last question, any recommendations of texts for beginners, and then we'll conclude. Oh, I mean, if 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 you can read Bullishah's poetry in Punjabi, then of course go ahead. But if you can't, I feel like there's this wonderful translation of at least some mainstream Sufis uh, online. Apna Apna Punjab. I feel like there's there's a website something Apna. I'm not sure exactly. Not I'm not sure, but I would I would encourage people to check out um, on Instagram Harleen Singh. Uh, he runs an account called the Singing Sikh, which is a which is about the history of Punjab and like the pre-colonial mm -hmm. Punjab, and it's real like his his work is incredible. Like what he's done with the Lost Here Lost Here project, which is talking about yeah. significant Punjabi women uh, in pre pre uh, colonial yeah. sorry pre partition Punjab. That's like fascinating stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would personally recommend um, this book. It's called 
The Female Voice in Sufi Ritual by Shamim Abbas. Uh, it's really incredible because it's talking about uh, devotional practices in Pakistan and India, and particularly the gender, um, uh, the gender, the gender roles in Sufi shrines. Yeah. Um, so it's really cool. And yeah, thank you so much, Harun. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thanks yeah, everyone who joined this. us. Sorry, go ahead, Harun. Yeah. No, yeah. Thank you so much for organizing this, and thank you everybody for wonderful questions and um, for joining in. Um, so the recording will be saved on our YouTube page, uh, so you can check it out uh, or and feel free to share with anybody. But yeah, thank you so much everyone for taking the time to join us. Hope this was an enlightening discussion. And uh, yeah, check out Harun's books uh, available for purchase. His, his recent book, uh, Imagining Lahore, I can't highly recommend enough. Um, and one day I, when I finally get my hands on walking with Nanak, we'll talk about that too. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, take care. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care.